Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for coming to the Whalen Library. We are excited today to have Whalen resident Wintrice here to talk to us about poetry and technology. Is this volume okay for everyone? Okay. Wynn is a software consultant, writer, teacher, and poet. Among other projects, he currently teaches computer security at Brandeis. Wynn helped start Open Market, one of the first internet commerce software companies, and later led software development at SciCortex, a Maynard-based supercomputer startup, and he's also worked at MIT and BU. Wynn is a current member of the Whalen Library Board, excuse me, the Whalen Board of Library Trustees, and served several terms on the school council at Whalen High School as a, both a parent and a community member. As a volunteer at the library, he helped start the Girls Who Code program and led the team of facilitators for four years before the pandemic. His most recent book is In the Cloud, Poems for a Technological Age, and he also previously co-authored the book Designing Systems for Internet Commerce. So thank you so much to Wynn for being here tonight. A couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording this session for broadcast on Wacam as well as for the library's YouTube page, so you'll be able to like and share afterwards. Uh, Wynn will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions. If you're joining us on Zoom, please put your questions in the chat at any time, and then I will read them aloud when we get to the Q&A section. And now I will get out of the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Is this volume okay for everyone? Great. Um, <clears throat> first, thank you for coming and, and welcome to the Whalen Public Library. Uh, as Courtney mentioned, I am on the Board of Library Trustees. As far as I know, the board had nothing to do with the selection <laughs> of this series, the Great Presenter series, um, which is fabulous. I'm honored to be in the company of the people who do this. Um, <clears throat> uh, is a committee that operates independently of the board, um, so just so we're clear on that. Uh, um, Courtney did mention that the impetus for the talk uh, is a book I published um, called In the Cloud for Technological Age, uh, and we'll be talking about the relationship of poetry and technology that in the process of doing this and subsequently thinking about some of these issues. Uh, the, uh, they will be for sale. Uh, uh, I'll have copies for sale afterwards that I can sign if anyone's interested. All of the proceeds from that will go to the Friends of the Wayland Public Library. Um, and, and I'm not getting any money from any of that tonight, um, uh, it, directly or indirectly. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't have any visuals uh, tonight because we're talking about poetry. Uh, poetry is an ancient tool for conveying emotion, information, memory. Um, uh, and so we're going to do this orally without visuals. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the visuals that can happen. Uh, consider the sentence, the red balloon drooped against the clear gray sky. For most of us, I think you get some image uh, in your mind almost without thinking about it. If we think about the words, what that means may be a little interesting. Clear gray sky. Gray sky, not usually what we call a clear sky. Um, <clears throat> what, what exactly does that mean? Uh, when I hear that or read that, my mind tries to make sense out of that. You sort of get a vague image about it. it's trying to get it, um, sort of like tuning in the signal. Um, a balloon drooping. How does a balloon droop? You what do you imagine for that? Um, you can ask Google about balloons drooping. Almost three million hits to web pages that have balloon and droop on them. Um, or that Google decides or might be relevant to this. You're not going to look at all of them. I certainly didn't. Um, <clears throat> most of the ones that pop up early sort of talk about a balloon uh, that's not quite pulling its string up. Right? It, it was inflated, uh, uh, maybe had some helium in it, and then sinking down and sort of like the string is not taut um, anymore. When I hear balloon droop, I try to think about how it is the shape of a balloon would droop. Um, maybe it, like in Salvador Dali's famous painting, um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> the clocks melting um, in the persistence of time was, was the painting. All right. But that's not a thing that balloons do uh, in the real world. Um, we won't talk much about AI tonight, although we can talk about it in the questions. 
um, later. Happy to do that. But I did ask Dali, one of these image generators that takes text and tries to give you an image for it. And it doesn't even try for this. It gives you a gray sky, just exactly what you imagine, sort of gray clouds in the background, and a red balloon with a string hanging from it. There's no droopiness to it at all. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure what that means, but I think in, at this time and, and place in technology, it's interesting that we get there. Uh, on the back cover of my book, I had to write back cover copy. That's harder than writing the poems in the book. <laughs> um, uh, and I wrote, because I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, uh, if technology is our landscape, we need poetry for illumination amid the vertigo, um, <clears throat> which felt apt in some way at the time I wrote that. Um, but I wonder about it now. How do poetry and technology work with each other, against each other? How do we communicate? Uh, and so tonight, we're going to explore some of how that conversation goes, um, partly through some poems uh, that are in the book, um, and partly with some other ideas that have come out sort of since, in my thinking uh, since then. Uh, <clears throat> but I want to start with a weird place, which is, and this is hinted at in the talk description, that poetry is a technology. It's a very, very old technology. It may precede the wheel. We don't know um, uh, for it. But it's a technology in a couple of ways. Um, one is that it's been used from memory for a very long time. If you know how many days are in the month of September almost instantly, it's probably because of a poem. Uh, uh, in the days of Homer, whatever those days were, and whoever Homer was, uh, the Bards managed to memorize a poem that in a book today is this thick and repeat it fairly consistently um, for their audiences. There are mnemonic tricks of the poetry that are used to encode the information in the poetry and is since what we might call in modern technology an error-correcting code that keeps the sense of the poem correct. And that comes from the meter, it comes from the rhyme, it comes from the repetition of phrases, uh, all of that. So there's a poetic technology embedded there that enabled this kind of storytelling. In fact, I'd like to start um, with a little bit of Homer. This is the very beginning of the Odyssey. In the recent translation uh, into poetry, which is not common for Homer because it's so hard to translate from the Greek by Emily Wilson, this is a fabulous translation, uh, and I highly recommend reading it. This is the very beginning, from book one. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed, and for their own mistakes they died. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. It's just a marvelous piece of poetry. The rendition to English is great. Iambic pentameter, which feels very English. It's not the hexameter that Homer used because that's what works in Greek. Uh, uh, but I love this translation. But also, just uh, in the poetry from that, so much of the story is laid out right there. Right? Where do you start with this complicated story? What ha what is happening? Uh, all of that is embedded in the first few lines. Just, um, <clears throat> poetry can do that for us. Um, <clears throat> Philip Larkin, uh, the poet, uh, once said that a poem has three essential elements to it. Um, the first is when he said a man, um, when the poet, uh, <clears throat> has an obsession with an emotional concept to be communicated to another person. The second is using poetic devices to create that emotional effect. This is the technology of, as a poet, creating an experience inside the head of someone else. The tool. Um, <clears throat> and the third part is the poetry must be read. It must be experienced, or otherwise it might as well not exist um, uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> 
the interesting thing, and I apologize for a little bit of a cough <clears throat> tonight, um, about that for our purposes is this second part, the tool. Uh, and in fact, in his, uh, I didn't read the quote because it's long and it's a little tedious to read actually. Um, he uses the term poetic device, right? And device is already putting us in a technology frame of mind for what we're thinking about um, <clears throat> when we do this. So I want to, as we move into this, uh, go into our topic by reading a poem by David White. Some of you may be familiar with his poetry. This is called Start Close In from his collection called Essentials. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first. Thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To hear another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes an intimate private ear that can really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in the step you don't want to take. I came across this poem sometime between when we started talking about the talk uh, and actually putting it together. Uh, and in a way, I think that's what we want to do tonight. We're going to take a step into this. There's a lot of writing about poetry and technology. Um, there's a lot of poetry that has been about technology. We're going to hit some of those points there. But this is really um, a beginning. Uh, uh, for me, this started in a writing group uh, just before the pandemic started. They joined an in-person writing group. Uh, coincidentally, that first meeting I came to was right here in this room at the Wayland Public Library. Some of the members are here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, and occasionally, the leader of the group would suggest, write a poem about something. I had never written a poem, I think, since I was required to, maybe in high school. Tried it a few times. It was interesting. Um, the experience of writing a poem is interesting. I actually highly recommend it. You don't have to do it well. You can try it. Um, um, uh, and then sometime later, I also joined an online writing group during the pandemic for a big project that I was working on. And in that project, we were mixed in writers of all kinds of genres and areas of writing uh, in a small group, about 12, 15 people, uh, <coughs> embedded in a larger group of a community of writers. We would typically post every day uh, what we were writing, what was in progress. You'd get some feedback, some comment. Many of the people, coincidentally, that I was with were writing poetry. I was not. I was writing about math and science and technology. Uh, and one day, in response to one of the things I had written to try to explain something mathematical, um, <clears throat> uh, my friend Galena wrote back and said, I can't understand all this math and science. I only understand poetry. <laughs> For some reason, the next day, I tried to write a poem explaining whatever it was I was explaining in mathematics at that time. That led to trying this again and again because people sort of, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and when people say that's kind of interesting, you do more of it. It's a natural kind of thing to happen. Uh, and one of the poems that came out of that sequence of things is we're going to try to explain a little mathematical concept. This is a poem called Let Me Count the Ways, based on a true story. Uh, waiting for the school bus, I watched the children play and began to wonder as they lined up that day. In just how many ways could they arrange themselves for getting on the bus like books upon the shelves? With two kids, it is easy, for one child must be first, or the other might begin if the order is reversed. It gets a little harder with three, and we must try, three choices for the first. Two remain, we multiply. For no matter who begins, there's two ways for the others, and three times two will count them 
even if the three are brothers. There's a glimmer of a pattern that's beginning to emerge. <clears throat> Let's try with four and then we'll see if our thinking will converge. Four choices for the first one, and then three must remain. So four times three times two times one makes 24, it's plain. And now we know the secret, and we multiply it out. All the numbers from the total down to one, there is no doubt. In math, this kind of problem is called a permutation, and factorial is the fancy name for this simple computation. That day I watched six children, and I worked it out, no fuss, that there's 720 ways for them to board the bus. Sharon's laughing because she knows all of these kids. Uh, true story. <laughs> Uh, and one thing led to another, and I tried to, to think about, can we explore some more complicated technology concepts um, uh, in this? Uh, I have a side thought that a collection of poems like the first one to accompany, say, the Algebra 1 curriculum might be kind of fun <laughs> for kids that are encountering it. I have not undertaken that. I don't know anyone who has. Um, but, you know, it's an opportunity if anyone's feeling inspired. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, and then I wrote one about technology. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll see how this works um, after I read it. Ode to an NFT. You may record, remember, remember NFTs in the news. Non-fungible token, but it's in the poem. Uh, that's okay. Um, it's a good question. Uh, and NFT sounds nifty, the latest techno thing, but maybe, maybe sort of shifty when you find out that it means non-fungible token. <laughs> Fungible sounds like fungus, but it's really all about making up a ruckus with nothing left to doubt. Fungible means things that can be interchanged. Put non in front, it then implies that something's not the same. A token's just a thing you buy that's almost like money. But all those things can, <clears throat> but those all can be swapped around with fungibility. NFTs are not the same; they must be unique. They represent what token means, with only one to seek. First, you mint an NFT with your magic crypto key, and then you put it on the blockchain for everyone to see. What's the blockchain? You may ask. As this starts to get complex, they say it's like a ledger that anyone can check then maybe you can sell your brand new NFT, but not the real original. On that, we can't agree. If someone reads this poem when a few more years are done, they may wonder what was happening in 2021. This poem's not an NFT, but maybe it should be, with its bits recorded perfectly for all of history. Uh, the interesting thing is, like some technologies, that feels very obsolete. That is, that is a 21, 21 phenomenon. It does not feel contemporaneous to us two years later um, uh, uh, for it. Uh, so starting to explore technology in poems. But technology crossing into a poem, not new. Um, it's been going on for a long time. <clears throat> this is a book. And I brought the book because it has a poem, uh, and there's a fun connection. This is an anthology of poetry that was edited by Martin Gardner, who for many, many years wrote the mathematical games column in Scientific American. So we're technology adjacent here, but here he is um, compiling best remembered poems. This is a lovely collection. Um, I don't know if it's in the library system, kind of old. Um, <clears throat> and this is a poem by Emily Dickinson. You may have heard of her. Uh, it's called, There Is No Frigate Like a Book. There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, nor any coursers like a page of prancing poetry. This traverse may, be, may the poorest take without oppressive toll. How frugal is the chariot that bears a human soul. We can go and we can highlight items of technology in this poem. There's a book. There's a frigate. There's a chariot. Um, uh, all of these have important meanings in the poem. Uh, frigate was probably more contemporary with Dickinson than chariots. 
Uh, <clears throat> uh, but that's new. But we can come a little closer. Here's one by Thomas Hardy, um, who was a poet. He may not be as familiar as a poet, um, as a novelist. Um, um, this is a uh, poem called Nobody Comes. Um, it's from 1924, and I'll come back to that. Um, Tree leaves labor up and down. Through them the fainting light succumbs to the crawl of night. Outside in the road the telegraph wire <clears throat> to the town from the darkening land intones to travelers like a spectral lyre swept by a spectral hand. A car comes up with lamps full glare that flash upon a tree. It has nothing to do with me and wings along in a world of its own, leaving a blacker air. And mute by the gate, I stand again alone, and nobody pulls up there. 1924. Um, that was actually relatively near the end of Hardy's life. He died in 1928. Um, he was born in 1841. Uh, and we feel like we live in a technology-busy time. 1840 to 1920, that was an incredibly busy technology time. You go from not having the telegraph to having the telegraph, the telephone, to radio. Um, you've got trains making their way across Britain, across the United States, across other places around the world. Um, <clears throat> uh, transportation changes, communication changes. Uh, in some ways, I think the telegraph may have been um, a bigger innovation in a communication than the internet was because before the telegraph, you waited days or weeks to get a message from far away. In the Crimean War, there was a telegraph line laid from the war to London um, <clears throat> so that the news was instantaneous from there. That's a communications revolution. Now, that's not to belittle the revolution we've seen with the internet just that it's not entirely new to have these things. And these things show up in poetry in 1924. Hardy is still making reference to a telegraph wire singing in the wind. Uh, not a metaphor we really understand these days. Um, so that's technology and poetry. I'd like to step for a moment to like, the state of poetry today. People say, poetry dead. They've been saying that, I think, for as long as I've been aware of people talking about poetry. That's been a question. Uh, and I'm not sure the answer has really changed during that time. So what is the state of poetry today? Or how can we think about that? Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing that's been suggested is that poetry, for the most part, moved to popular music. Um, and that obscured it for a lot of us, because you can't always understand the lyrics <laughs> when you hear the song especially with rock and roll, although sometimes with other things. Um, Hip-hop today, tremendous amount of poetry, immensely popular. Um, <clears throat> uh, different set of cultural dimensions, but I just look at poetry in that sense and say, doing pretty well um, uh, out there. Uh, <clears throat> but from when I was growing up, we'd get some of it in schools, uh, and people would say, why aren't we doing more of it? Uh, and I think there have been some things over the past 50, 60, 80 years um, about it that uh, have pushed poetry out of the culture in the sense that we sort of try to remember it back to a, an earlier era, whenever that was. Um, <clears throat> uh, one, I would say, is widespread literacy. And poetry as a primary oral experience yeah, happens more when people are not reading on their own. Um, it's a little harder to read a poem by yourself. It's interesting in public or to hear someone reading it. So the more literate the population is, the less of it that happens. That's a hypothesis. I don't have solid data on that. Seems kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> silent reading. Right, we get used to reading silently and one of the things as I have encountered poetry over the years and certainly much more recently when I started thinking about it and trying to read more of it is 
reading it silently just doesn't work that well. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, at a minimum, you sort of have to sound it out in your head, but I find that you get the impact more by actually vocalizing it, by saying it, by hearing it, and how it comes out and realize, oh, I didn't get that rhythm quite right. Or the poet did something about the rhythm I was expecting that's creating some effect, and it's probably not an accident. In the NFT poem, the last line of the first bit, non-fungible token, is not of the same meter as everything else. That was, that was a deliberate choice. I'm not claiming to be a brilliant poet, I just, but I made that choice um, <clears throat> for it. I, I wonder if our schools have contributed to a lack of interest uh, in poetry, um, partly by de-emphasizing it in the curriculum, for maybe some of the reasons we've just talked about or others. Um, <clears throat> there was a little bit uh, in schools when I was growing up, but the challenge looking back on it is that in school, in high school in particular, was you're gonna analyze the poem. Um, the emphasis is not on experiencing the poem. What is the, you know, you're getting quizzed on what is the meaning of this poem. Um, I'm not sure that any poem has one meaning. Uh, I'm not sure I can tell you what the meanings of mine are, and I certainly don't mind if you have a different idea about what the meaning of the poem is. Um, I think that's actually essential to poetry. Poetry is often about ambiguity, about multiple things going on. So how can you expect a 10th grader to tell you the meaning of the poem? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good way to turn off readers. Um, who are not enjoying the experience of the poetry um, in, in what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> uh, poetry, I think, requires slowing down a little bit. And I think we're all accustomed to thinking life has been made faster, largely by technology, to bring this back to our topic tonight. Uh, it has a big influence um, on that. Uh, <clears throat> but. Uh, as things go faster, we're less inclined to slow down. Uh, and then when you put all this in how we read today, often on screens, often skimming, not reading to get every word. And part of the construction of a poem is every word matters. The word choices matter, right? Why this word versus that word? It's a lot less true in emails. Right? You can get away with all kinds of <coughs> um, things there. <coughs> um, but uh, in poetry, there's a lot of effort that goes into uh, choosing the words um, to create the experience back to the emotional tool um, of poetry. Um, and when we slow down, we skim, like you skip a line of the poem, you may get the gist of it, but you're not getting the poem in that case. Um, uh, and I think writing today is perhaps even commonly designed to be skimmed um, uh, so that it's not dense with information because the density will get missed. And good poems are often very dense, not in the sense of being hard to understand, but having a lot packed in there. Uh, coincidentally, or not, the, uh, I wrote a poem about this effect. It's called Skimming. We skim the cream, thinking we take what is best, but the milk still has merit. We skim the water, grazing the wave tips, the feeling of speed. We skim the scum, not realizing that the word scum originated together in, a wor in, in an ancient word for foam. <clears throat> we skim the book, trying to adjust its meaning quickly with less energy. We skim the code to understand its function, trying to avoid the messy details. We skim the top, yet only to understand the bottom. We skim by choice, sometimes forgetting, sometimes remembering that what is left behind may have value in its depth. <clears throat> that was an example of a poem that I didn't articulate the, the introduction to it. That is the concept 
being expressed through writing and exploring what I was thinking about to uncover that. A lot of these were written in a way that discovered what I was thinking about in a way. They were not deliberately set out to accomplish what, <clears throat> what the poem tries to do. The poem about the school bus was directly trying to do one thing. Others of these, the experience of writing, was much more the key to it. <clears throat> so when we talk about technology these days, um, a lot of it is about dangers or what's coming or what's not working. We'd like to start with the question, can technology delight us? Can we be excited about it? Sometimes that happens. Uh, <clears throat> when the iPhone was first introduced in the mid-2000s, I forget the year, I forgot to look it up, uh, <clears throat> the, there was intense excitement about it. People were standing in very, very long lines first day it was available. Um, David Pogue, technology writer, who was then at the New York Times, made a music video about it. Um, about how thrilling it was. So it, it's a fun video, although now iPhone, new iPhone, Apple releases one every year. Uh, frankly, does anyone care? And it, it, if you need a new one, you go and you get the one that, that, that's there. Um, but it's not that exciting to go get the new one. Um, the, the, the iPhone, to be fair, is one of the most complicated devices ever created by humankind. It's an incredible piece of work. Um, on so many levels, from the hardware um, <clears throat> to its communications capabilities um, to the software and the design um, that goes into it. Um, can technology delight us? I'd like to share a poem written by Richard Brodigan in 1967. Um, <clears throat> it's called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think, right now please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think, it has to be, of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and join back to nature return to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. There's some controversy among critics about how, whether he wrote that earnestly, um, in an optimism about the coming ages, with the computers that we were building in the 1960s and the promise that it had, or whether he was ironic about it, and this was not the future to aspire to. That actually <clears throat> is a controversy about that. Uh, looking back on it, my feeling, uh, I read it and if it's the optimistic side, the earnest side, he got it wrong. <laughs> it does not feel like we are on anything like that kind of path. Um, ironic, then he succeeded. <laughs> But I don't know um, uh, which way that was. And so when we try to make poetry about technology, I wonder how well it works. Um, in the <clears throat> original description for this, which I wrote frankly because I had to write something by a deadline, I used the line, shall I compare thee to the latest iPhone? Thou art more featureful and more game-changing. The second line was not in there. I added that later. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have to say, that does not compare to shall I compare thee to a summer's day. <laughs> uh, uh, and I think there's something interesting about that. Like, technolo can technology compete with the summer's day? In some sense, it does every day. Right? We sit inside an air conditioning looking at our phones. Technology <laughs> seems to win that battle. Um, but the emotional effect, the emotional affect um, of the summer's day 
of, of comparing the beloved to the summer's day resonates very, very deeply for us in a way that the iPhone just does not. <clears throat> so what we see with technologies often, especially in the, the digital era, is some idea with romantic ideals. That the internet is going to enable worldwide communication. Um, <clears throat> and then it moves into a phase of boring reality. Oh yeah, we're on the internet all the time. We just use it. It's a utility. It is not magical anymore. At one time, it was. Um, often it gets squeezed to make more money. Um, and things are expensive, and we feel like the price is out of line with the value that we get. Uh, and then it becomes obsolete. It's a technology cycle. Um, poetically, we don't find the same kind of thing. Right? Homer, still good. Shakespeare, still good. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there are poems that go out of favor. Certainly famous poets, um, you can look at the one in Gardner's book. Best remembered poems, many of them not remembered. Ironically, um, that was a thing he was setting out looking at was uh, in compiling the collection is thinking about previous collections that were no longer remembered. Um, so some of it remains, but um, much of it does not. Uh, technology is interesting in a slightly different way. Um, this is a poem called It's Magic from, from my book. Um, it's magic. Technology can seem like magic, but the magic can disappear. Maybe the magic disappears because we learn how it works. Often the magic disappears because it is commonplace, receding into the background. And we forget about everything it takes, all the human effort, all the ingenuity, all the embedded knowledge to make our world full of unrecognized magic. What I think of from that is the water system. Massive piece of technological infrastructure, in a sense. We don't think about it. It worked. It works all the time. It's un very unusual for the water system to fail. Um, <clears throat> that's very good. We forget about it. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to pay for the maintenance on the system that has to, to happen. Um, for it. In systems with wastewater treatment, there's an even bigger set of issues there. Um, I once got a tour of Deer Island, the wastewater treatment plant for Boston. Um, and it's an amazing operation, technologically, in so many ways. Um, but that's all hidden from most of us day to day. Uh, <clears throat> technology becomes invisible because it works so well, and we forget about it with some risk that then does anybody know how to take care of it? <clears throat> I'm jumping a little bit because the, in trying to think about technology and poetry, a lot of questions came to mind, and I wanted to bring them to you because I think they're worth thinking about and they're hard to dig into. So why not have more of them? Uh, <clears throat> another question that comes up, uh, and it came up with a poem, uh, is how our tools shape us. We shape the tools, obviously, but do the tools shape us? <clears throat> this poem is called Putting the Hammer Down. Does the tool shape the way we view the world? They say, for the one who has a hammer, everything looks like a nail. For the one who has a computer, is the world merely a problem of data? Perhaps there are times to put down the tools and see the world anew. This feels contemporary because computers, data, we can solve anything with that. No, maybe not. Um, Run into some problems with that. Don't have the right data. Didn't collect it the right way. It's complicated um, <clears throat> to do it. I think all of us have the experience of using hammer for more than one thing uh, <clears throat> that is not nails. Uh, <clears throat> and interestingly, we can extend this to thinking about how technology affects the way we view the world in some really subtle ways. <clears throat> this one is called Metaphorically Speaking. We did not think that the universe worked like clockwork 
until after we invented clocks. We did not speak of analog watches until after we invented the digital. We did not say everything is relative until after there was a theory of relativity. We did not say the brain is like a computer until we made computers. We did not brag of multitasking until we made computers do it first. Could it be that our conception of nature is limited by the technology we can build? I don't know. That's a question. <laughs> uh, uh, lots of questions. That's what I discovered in writing these. Um, is, is there was something to be said, but there was always a question that seemed not quite answerable uh, at the end. But the questions are worth thinking about. <clears throat> Here's another one in that vein um, called Entombed Knowledge. Humans are good at outsourcing what we know. Spouses remember things so we don't have to. We build systems, each person playing a part, no one knowing how to do everything. We construct machines, building in our knowledge. Later, no one knows how or why they actually work. One of the things that we don't know much about I think is how our information is collected and used on the internet. In some of this writing, uh, I ended up, accidentally again, um, exploring some ideas that I'd been planning to write essays about. Uh, this next one is an example of that. I'd been thinking about um, writing an essay that detailed and researched um, <clears throat> the question that the poem raises. Um, because I think there's a serious problem that we're not paying enough attention to for it. Um, and then I wrote it as a poem. And, I, and that was interesting, and you can make your own decision about that. Um, a poem is called Who Knows? Uh, and the title is Who Knows? Without, it's not a question mark. You might think that there should be one there, or maybe not. But it does not have a question mark. Who Knows? when I read the front page of the New York Times on the web. The Times does, of course. I expect that. My ISP knows, because they can see where the packets are going, even if the data is encrypted. Advertisers and their enablers know. Amazon and Google and Oracle and Yahoo and more. Advertising technologies, companies whose names we do not recognize, they know. Web performance analysts, Companies we never hear about, they know. Companies who promise the Times to monitor and optimize their content for long-term audience loyalty, they know. All this before I have read a single article, <laughs> which also they know. <laughs> Data collection is something that's going on there. We don't know what that is. Um, I actually wrote an essay about this a while back um, and distilled the essay to uh, a poem in the collection. Caution, data collection ahead. There are three laws of data collection. One, if data is collected, it will be stored. Two, if data is stored, it will be used in a way not expected. Three, stored data will leak. That's reassuring. Wow. <laughs> this has been a bit of a journey in a lot of ways. We're in a library, uh, and I thought it might be nice to come back to the library for a couple of poems before we get to some Q&A if anybody has any questions. First one is called, My eBooks Have No Shelves. My eBooks have no shelves, no visibility, as I walk by or gaze across the room. My ebooks do not lure me as I spy the cover while looking for something else. My ebooks do not taunt me from the shelves, reminding me I have not yet read them. My ebooks have no heft, no presence, no sensual distinction, no physical aesthetics. 
Mostly, I forget I have them. I wrote this collection, and I, I wrote a bunch of poems. Uh, and then I selected some that I thought were not embarrassing. Um, <laughs> uh, and tried to assemble a collection out of which is the, the result was the book. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and a lot of them to me, and they may have been feeling to you, feel a little dark in my view of technology these days. Um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of it I don't think is unfounded. That's my opinion. Um, but that's what came out in the writing. That was the, the, apparently what I was thinking on some level. Uh, this next one has a little bit of an edge to it, but I also bring it here as a point of hope. Um, it's called Information Places. I go into the library. I go onto the net. The library looks ordered with inviting places to sit, books arranged on shelves, shelves arranged in long rows. The net lets me search or jump around, following links from here to there. In the library, I find related, related items near each other, more or less. On the net, I am always in the middle of things, never at the beginning, or the end. In the library, I gain a sense of the breadth of a topic and its depth. On the net, I have a sense that I can drill down following links forever. In the library, I feel surrounded by knowledge and wisdom that can be, obtain can be attained. On the net, I find myself wondering if knowledge and wisdom really exist. I find contemplation in the library. I feel caught in the net. Thank you. I'd like to open it for questions. Steve. When you have a life to leave, you're involved technically, you're involved with the library and so forth. Where does your time go or how do you spend your time when you're writing poems? Do you sit there and all of a sudden say, I'm going to write a poem? Or do you go down Saturday and say, I'm leaving Saturday morning for poems? Or what? That is a great question. Um, so the poems I ha almost all the poems that are written and all the ones that, that are in the book um, came because of the daily writing challenge in my online writing group. Um, and uh, I was working on a project and the, the idea is you post something related to work on the project and post the progress you made, whether it's 15 minutes or an hour you worked on it that day. And I doubled that challenge for some reason <laughs> uh, um, uh, over several months um, to write a poem every day in addition to the other thing I was doing. Um, uh, where these came from, I have to write a poem today. <laughs> uh, 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 and most of them came as, uh, the first draft came in a time on one day um, for it. And some of them needed more or less work um, after that. Um, and sometimes, frankly, it was, it's 10.30 at night. I haven't written a poem yet. <laughs> That's how they got written. <laughs> Squeezed in around everything else. Um, and something about deadlines, about having to do it, about having the commitment to do it, generated a lot. It also generated a lot that were not very good. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of them came out. Uh, and for me, uh, as I was describing, um, were surprising in the sense about what they ended up being about. Um, I did not expect that uh, often because I would start the poem not knowing where it was going um, uh, and I would get there somehow. Did the germ for the idea, you have a specific time you're writing this poem, during the day you say, oh, that's a great idea, I'm going to do that tonight when I write the poem, or did you sit down and say, uh oh, i got to come up with something? Uh, occasionally both, probably more of the second category. I've got to sit down and come up with something now. Um, uh, sometimes I would make note of a, a, an idea that I had uh, and would, would come to it. Um, but often it was, uh, it was what came at the moment. Uh, and a lot of these things, as you might guess from the ones that, that we've done here, it, it, there's something I had been thinking about, um, uh, <clears throat> like this question about who knows when you visit the New York Times website and how big a list of people that is. <laughs> um, that I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, and then... Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, sometimes it's the, oh, I can do this thing about 
getting on the bus uh, and then have some fun with it. Yes? Well, thank you. Interesting uh, you know, talk. And so you mentioned Homer and Shakespeare. So how are they a part of technology to, to you? Um, so uh, I think that uh, with, with Homer, um, the, uh, there are two pieces of it. Um, one is that Homer uses most of the poetic devices we know about today as devices to create the images, the emotions, the feelings when you experience listening to or reading the poem. So that, that, that's one. Um, Homer's also a great example of the construction for memory. Um, uh, <clears throat> because the, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting scholarly research um, on uh, <clears throat> how bards who, and I'm just using the dark, bards who can recite long pieces of poem uh, can learn them. Um, and there's evidence that similar techniques in pre-literate civilizations were used to carry along the civilizational knowledge about how you make things, about the seasons, about the crops. Uh, these things were oral tradition, and the way that those ended up being composed would have mnemonic devices built in to it um, so we can remember them like 30 days past September. Um, uh, <clears throat> Shakespeare, um, more the, uh, not so much the could be remembered, although you had to learn a lot if you're doing the plays um, uh, for them. Meter and rhyme, well, uh, meter helps a lot with that just by itself. Um, uh, but I think that, of course, the brilliance of Shakespeare is the devices used just to create the impressions on us and how brilliant he was at doing that in both the plays um, and in the poems. John. You, uh, you compared your, your iPhone poem to The Summer's Day. And I wanted to, and you, you claimed that it didn't measure up or it didn't compare, I think, to what you said. But is the core beauty of The Summer's Day for most of us in the just mass repetition that we've heard it our whole lives, right? Like at this point, the poem is a poem that all of us know as opposed to something that most of us probably have would, would reading on the first time be particularly struck by the beauty of the summer day or the comparison to the love. My question is, in a world where we can appreciate you know, the, the amazing technology and experience of something like the iPhone, do you think, do you really think that there's that far of a distance between the poem that you wrote and the poem comparing thee to a summer's day? Um, so I want to distinguish two things. Um, one is the, um, uh, you're, you're right, the, the repetition of the, the line, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, um, has an echo all of its own um, for it. Um, I think that uh, what I want to get at is the, the metaphor there, um, the summer's day, summer day versus iPhone, <laughs> right? It's just <laughs> um, uh, the uh, we can look at you know empirically, like going out on a summer's day versus using the phone, the phone's winning <laughs> for that for a whole lot of people uh, most of the time. Um, I think that the emotional resonance of the summer's day is still way, way more powerful for it. Uh, uh, and it's an interesting question about then why that does not translate into the utilitarian decision about what you're going to do um, for it. Um, uh, so it's complicated. Uh, it just it feels like that there's a category of human experience aside from technology that has a much stronger resonance from relationships and nature than we do with technology. In particular because the technology is often superseded by something better or it, became, it becomes so normal. Now you might think summer day is pretty normal. Still a lot of, like, you know, at least once a year you feel like this is a great summer day. There's a book behind you that kind of relates. Are we spiritual machines? I noticed that. <laughs> um, I just love that. Yes. And that 
Uh, it, it, it's, uh, the title is, Are We Spiritual Machines? Um, uh, Ray Kurzweil versus the Critics of Strong AI. It's a collection of, of essays um, about it. Um, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book in the age of spiritual machines um, where he makes very strong claims about what machines will be able to do. Um, we're not there yet. Um, and that's when this question about the emotional resonance from machines actually becomes interesting. Um, we'll see what happens uh, if we get there. Uh, in some ways, that seems pretty scary, but that's me. Um, so there's a, I just, you can buy this for a buck, by the way. <laughs> uh, a comment that isn't the iPhone a summer day compared to the Blackberry it replaced. <laughs> <laughs> technology and made it fun. Maybe that's magic. Um, but also, that now that you just mentioned AI, let me find the question. Question from a current high school teacher who still teaches poetry. Does it depress you or impress you that AI could have generated your collection in a minute or two? <laughs> um, uh, so the AI question in poetry. I, I thought about actually talking about that. Um, I figured we'd probably get to it in, in, in the Q&A. Um, uh, so it's interesting, we're sort of a year into the large language model of AI being publicly accessible. The researchers had it for a little longer, people have been playing around with it, including experiments with poetry. Um, but you can go to ChatGPT or one of the other large language model AIs now and, and ask it to write a poem. I've done that. I've read the poetry uh, <coughs> that they make. Uh, it is not good. Um, in my opinion, I am not an expert as a poetry critic or as a poet. I do not want to make any claim to that. But there are some things about it that I've noticed. Um, <clears throat> one is that there are emotional words, but there's no emotional affect to them. They feel very flat to me in the examples I have seen. Now, some of them may have better examples than I've seen. That's great. Um, um, the other is that they don't understand poetic devices. And they, 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 large language models, and there's a long conversation to be had about exactly what's going on with them, don't have an understanding. They are language models. They're reproducing language. Uh, uh, and so uh, they will construct things that uh, <clears throat> are based on the language they have learned that reflects a poetic device, like metaphor but they don't get the metaphors right, um, uh, necessarily. Uh, or they're very common metaphors. Uh, it's, um, uh, but they're not interesting novel metaphors, for the most part. In the, again, sample I've seen. Um, the other it's interesting is that in the early months um, of ChatGPT, uh, some people were saying it, uh, and actually ChatGPT was generating sonnets when it wasn't available. It would just generate a sonnet for you to read. Um, and <clears throat> the thing about sonnets is that they have a very clear structure. Um, and it had the, the four, 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 two. So <clears throat> three quatrains and a couplet had that. It rhymed, but the rhyme scheme was wrong. Yeah, it, 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 sonnet, we've got rules for it. Uh, and it didn't get the rhyming right. It had it partially right. Um, uh, <clears throat> but it also did not get meter because it doesn't know how to count syllables. Um, uh, and so uh, the, um, uh, in, in the way they're done, harder than you think. It's possible, but th that they've not been trained in a way to do that. I, I think that this, is, this, is not an, this one is not an unsolvable problem. Um, but yes. Yes, <clears throat> so, um, uh, and for the high school um, English teacher, uh, Love to have a better conversation than we had right here uh, about this. That's just been my observation. So, uh, <clears throat> the um, I think that Chat GPT, uh, <clears throat> Chat GPT could generate a collection of poetry. Uh, it might be better than mine because I'm not claiming mine is good, <laughs> but uh, it's not expert poet quality. Yes. Yeah, great talk. I, I would say, but one claim you did, you did make is that some of your poems are not good and that you discarded them. So I, I, I'm joking. About yes. That. So I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind elaborating on how you made this choice of which poems to keep and which to exclude from this particular collection. 
Um, so that, right. Um, so the uh, my next book is not is most probably will not be a poetry book. I'm working on another book, but it's history. It's a, it's a project that I was working on when I took the sidetrack to do the poetry. Um, uh, and uh, so it's uh, very different um, from it. Um, there were some that uh, I, I would say just didn't work. Uh, there were some that didn't fit in with what was sort of emerging thematically for the ones that I chose to include. Um, uh, and they could uh, be edited, revised, included in a different collection if I get back to that. Um, an interesting thing about the project, um, and I think this is interesting to myself, is that uh, when I finished the book, I really felt like writing more poetry. Now, part of it was I got out of this, I'm doing it every day, the situation, and partly it was taking up time. <laughs> Um, uh, but something uh, changed about the motivation to do that. So I sort of hope to come back to it sometime, but it, it, uh, it's not been a practice I've been continuing, so I'm not uh, generating those. And, and I don't remember the ones that didn't make it in now well enough. Some of them were, were I, I thought were not bad, um, um, but they just didn't fit into uh, what was happening with the ones that, that seemed to work. Um, how much do you revise a poem? for the first draft and for how long? I think it's, <clears throat> I feel embarrassed about this. Uh, the answer is not much and not very long. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so I have a sense that if I worked at them, they could, I could make them better. Um, uh, the uh, part of the conceit of the writing program was to get the work done and publish. And make uh, uh, and and so I went with that um, for it. Uh, the ones that rhyme, I worked on longer <laughs> to get the rhymes in. Um, uh, very often, uh, my experience was I would, would come back and look at it, and I would tweak a little bit of the wording. Um, but the uh, in the writing of those. Uh, <clears throat> um, the feeling that I had at the time got expressed. I didn't see a way to improve on that or to get back into that feeling in the same way. Uh, and so the words as they were um, were good. This, I think, is an advantage of free verse, which is most, this, this mostly is. If you're trying to get the meter and the rhyme right, um, that requires really concentrating on what you're doing, which draws you into thinking more about the emotional effect I'm trying to create. Um, uh, I did not write these poems in the way Larkin sort of says you should write them, um, <clears throat> uh, by being obsessed with the emotional effect I want to create. Um, the, uh, I wrote them as an expression of something that I was thinking or feeling internally uh, and shared it. Do you listen to music with lyrics differently? And do you ever want to put your poems to uh, music? I have never thought about putting them to, uh, to, to music. It just that it had never occurred to me um, uh, for that. And uh, I would say that the did you mean listen to lyrics differently now than before? Yeah. Um, uh, occasionally, um, the I am more likely now to to pause and actually say, okay, I'm going to pay attention to the lyrics um, for it. Uh, and if I could throw in a podcast recommendation, because that's what we do these days, um, uh, <clears throat> there's a podcast that's based on um, uh, interviews for a book with Paul McCartney on the lyrics in his songs. Uh, I haven't read the book. I imagine the book has to be pretty good. The podcast is recordings of uh, the author's name, also named as Paul, Paul Muldoon, um, uh, talking to McCartney about the lyrics and the thought and the things that McCartney talks about thinking about as he was doing those is fascinating in terms of the creative, under, uh, understanding the creative process. I think there was a video of that. There, the yeah. Video. So any encounter with that, um, highly recommend. Go ahead. Oh, um, how and why do you share your poems with others, and how does their reaction inspire you for your next poems? Um, so. Uh, the 
All of the poems that I wrote that I sorted through for this were shared with my online writing community. Um, so someone saw them. Uh, many of them got shared uh, with my in-person writing group, um, <clears throat> some of whom were here. Uh, I didn't really show them to other people before making the book um, uh, for it. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm not really writing more now, so nobody's getting to see, see them right now. Um, but might come back, not ruling it out. I'd like to sort of follow up on what you talked about AI uh, <laughs> in the chat just today. One of the ways of looking at it is if you look at the first digital cameras and you compare them to the mm. photographic cameras, there was no comparison. You could barely see the image with the digital cameras. And then 10 years later, they're as good or better, in many people's opinion, certainly much, much further along. If you looked into the future, one, would you see that the chat would create poems as good or better than anybody else? And I guess I'll stop. Right, OK. Um, so the uh, uh, digital camera um, uh, question, uh, analogy is interesting, um, because that's exactly what killed Kodak. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the friend of early days, Kodak actually was early on inventing digital photography. Uh, and they would bring prints from digital cameras to show them to the executives. And the executives would pull out their loops and look at them and say, the quality on this is terrible. No one will ever want it. Didn't invest. They did not see um, what, Steve, you're seeing of things get better um, for it. Um, I think there are clearly some things that uh, could happen with AI uh, to improve their poetry. Um, one is, uh, as we mentioned, uh, <clears throat> the, it's probably not a hard technical problem to teach them to do syllable counting better. Uh, that, that's just a thing we know how to do. Um, <clears throat> and dictionaries all have the syllable information for it, so that's not even hard. Um, uh, so they could get that. Uh, they could be taught that they're uh, about poetic forms, like the, the, the sign of the cage. You gotta rhyme uh, the first and third lines too. <laughs> um, uh, in the sonnet. Uh, what is hard to tell is the emotional affect uh, about it. Uh, and I just do not know about that. Uh, it may be that the kinds of systems that are being used and, and the language they're trained on could be um, create the impression of emotional affect. And there are people who would argue that we're going to, you know, the AIs are going to get to the point of they will have emotional affect anyway um, for it. Um, but I think that's actually a much harder thing. Um, that being said, um, in a few years, they may be able to write sort of poems that on a first reading, most of us would think are, are better than most of us write. Um, but they're not as good as Amanda Gorman. <laughs> Right. Um, so I wanted to uh, thank you for coming. I wanted to thank the organizers of the Great Presenter Series. Steve's involved with that, so I appreciate that. Courtney um, also for, for hosting this and her involvement in all the programming uh, at the Wayland Library. I want to thank the library um, and the Friends of the Wayland Public Library. Uh, they run the book sale here. You can browse. You can buy some books for, for not very much um, and support the Friends and indirectly the uh, the Wayland Library. I'd like to thank my online writing group and my in-person writing group, so especially those who came tonight. Uh, I know some friends are on, on the Zoom. Um, thank you for coming, uh, and you've all been part of this in some way, um, even if you didn't know it, uh, for it. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I have books for sale that I'm happy to sign. I don't have anything to make change with. Um, retail price is 15 bucks, and the money will go to the friends, um, if anybody wants that. Uh, and I wanted to close with the title poem from the collection. Uh, in the cloud. I look up and see the clouds. Is my data in the cloud? I look up and see the wispy cirrus clouds. Is my data scattered in the wisps? I look up and see the fluffy cumulus clouds. Is my data in the shape of a duck? I look up at the clear blue sky. Is my data gone? They tell me my data is in the cloud. They tell me my data is safe. 
I look up and I do not know what data is in the cloud. My data in the cloud is somewhere on the net. Where are the clouds? Where on the net? I look up and watch the clouds slowly float away. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming.